We pray in the presence of God be in your life today. We pray that His Spirit fills you wherever you are. We want to thank you for joining us. Again, I say, and we're going to sing today about a hope that we have in Jesus Christ. He is our cornerstone. When everything else seems to fall apart, we can rest in Jesus. He is our cornerstone. When everything seems to be going south, we can rest in Jesus. When the storms come, we can rest in Jesus. We know that when all else fails, the cornerstone will always be there. That we can lean on. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. It's in Jesus Christ we come to today. Our hope is built nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
recognize you, that when the storms come and the winds blow, that you are still Lord. We want to recognize that my hope is built on nothing else than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Father, God, the song says that the weak are made strong. Savior's love. Father God, we need you today. Maybe more than ever, we need you today. Father God, we need you to come into our lives. Father God, Father God, we need you to pick us up from where we are. We need you to show us the way. Father God, we love you this morning. Father God, we recognize today that our world is broken. We need you. Father God, we need Jesus. We need your love. We need your grace. We need your mercy. Father God, we need your understanding. Father God, we need your peace. Father God, we need you today. We cry out to God of the universe. Father God, we want you to speak to us today, direct our path. Father God, I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what tomorrow holds for this world. I don't know what tomorrow holds for this church. But Father God, I know that you are in control. I know that you are the God who is guiding and directing. And you are the God who is going to put us where you need us to be. Pray for those who are still dealing with the sickness, Father. We pray for Father God, we pray for all of It's been messed up for a while. Sin has just taken over. Father God, we want to offer forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Show us where we need to change. Father God, show us where we can help. We're just throwing ourselves at your feet today, Father God, and we pray that the Spirit of God pick us up and show us where to go. Father God, as we dive into your word today, I pray that your spirit would speak to us. I pray that we would hear from you today. Wherever we are, sitting in our homes, maybe with our neighbors. Father God, speak to us today. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. All that you're going to do. In your name we pray all things. Amen. Amen. telling myself one of these days I'm going to walk off this platform without crying. You haven't noticed already, if you're new to this church through a virtual meeting, you're going to come to understand that I tend to cry a lot. It's okay, I got picked on as a child, but it seems to be working for me. 
cry because the Spirit of God is so real right now. He is moving in and through us. And I pray that you feel the Spirit of God with you today. Wherever you are, may the Spirit of God fall fresh on you. We talked last week a little bit about Pentecost and how the power of the Almighty God came down from heaven and rested on His people. In a world that is broken, in a world that needs Jesus, I pray that the Spirit of God falls heavy on us today. I began looking at a passage of Scripture, and God said, look at another one. And I found myself in Matthew chapter 24. If you have your Scriptures today, you can turn to Matthew chapter 24. But I, first, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story of Mike and Johnny. You don't know Mike and you don't know Johnny. Two teenage boys, they live down the street from each other. They know each other because their parents work together and become good friends. Johnny and Mike, they're two adolescent boys, the eldest of their household, as far as children are concerned. They have siblings that look up to them as all young siblings do. They look up to their older brothers. One day, the boy's parents came to them and said, we are going out. We've been working real hard. We've been parenting real well. It's time for parents to have a night out. They had arranged a beautiful dinner to go to. They were going to have a beautiful dinner at a beautiful location. And from there, they were going to the theater. Not the movies, the theater. For anybody under the age of like 20 watching this, you can look up what, or ask your parents what a theater is. Not a movies, but a theater. They sat, their parents, they sat the parents sat the kids down, they sat Mike, and they sat Johnny down, and they said, we are leaving for the evening. We're going to be away most of the day. We're going to be traveling into the city. We're going to be dining at a nice restaurant. We're going to go to the theater. We're going to leave early afternoon. We're going to come back late at night. Mike and Johnny, you're in charge. Now, they're both not in charge of each other's household. Johnny's in charge of his. Mike is in charge of his. The parents go away. Mike and Johnny have the house to themselves. They have been giving much responsibility. They had the responsibility of making sure the siblings had dinner. They had the responsibility of making sure the house was nice and clean when the parents got home. They were given tasks to do. They were given the responsibility of being the head of the house. Mike and Johnny, wherever they were in their respected homes, had the responsibility placed upon them to be in charge. And with any parent giving a teenage boy the keys to the house, there were rules. You know what the rules were? No friends. That's right. Every teenage boy who's been put in charge of his house knows that there are no friends. No friends can come over. Johnny goes, but what about so-and-so? I don't know the name of the kid. Mike's parents said, okay, you can have one friend over. And one friend only. Well, then his the sister chimed in, but well, what about Susie? Fine, Susie can come over. You can have two friends over. Mike and Johnny were responsible for making sure everybody had dinner, making sure everybody. There was also another rule. You know what the other rule is? No fighting with your siblings. I used to love that rule, because you know, the moment mom and dad left the house, <laughs> there was going to be a fight. I'm in charge, you have to listen to me. 
But mom and dad made it very clear to Mike and to Johnny, there will be no fighting with your siblings. You are in charge. You must respect your siblings. You must respect the honor of being in charge of the house. The third rule, very simple, the house needs to be clean. We're going to be away for a good eight hours. The house needs to be clean when we get home. And mom and dad, a boat, Mike and Johnny, loaded up into one car and made the journey to the city for a night out without any children. Every parent's dream to have a night out without their children. I'm going to pause my story there and I'm going to turn you to Matthew chapter 24. And I just have one question for you today. I don't usually title my sermons with questions, but today I felt it very prudent after we spoke last week. I have a question for you, and the question is this. Are you serious? Are you serious about the calling in which God has given you? Are you serious about the relationship with Jesus Christ? Let me put into context for you a little bit of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 20, 24 starts with some very simple instructions given by Jesus or comments. And he's talking about the future. Matthew chapter 24 begins with Jesus talking about things like the buildings of this city will be completely destroyed. He says things like, when, when these things happen, many will come in my name to lead you astray. Many will try to pull you from your relationship with me. He begins to tell them that wars will break out. Famines and earthquakes will happen. And this is only the beginning. And many will turn from me, Jesus speaking, and betray and hate each other. Now, now, I didn't set out this morning to preach a sermon on the end times. I didn't set out to preach a sermon about the end of the world. And I certainly did not set out to preach a sermon about when Jesus is going to return. The truth of the matter is, no one knows the day or the hour Jesus could return today. He could return tomorrow. He could return 10 years from now, 100 years from now. The only one who knows is God himself. This is not a message of end times. I'm not here to preach a message of the world is coming to an end. I'm here to preach a message of concern. Concern. Are we taking our responsibilities seriously? For the last several weeks, I've been preaching this idea that we have been called by God. We have been called for a higher purpose. We have been set apart for, for ministering the gospel. Last week, I preached about Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go and make disciples. Go make disciples to all nations. And today I want to ask you, are we taking the message seriously? I asked my wife a question as we were watching the news today, this week. Part of me was being a little facetious. The other part of me was absolutely serious. I looked at my wife and I said, are you ready to meet Jesus? Most of you know my wife. If you don't, don't, don't know my wife, my wife is a lifelong Nazarene, grew up in the church, spent her life dedicated to the church. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt if my wife would die, she's going to heaven. She's going to be with Jesus. But I looked at my wife and I said, are you ready to meet Jesus? It's been on my mind. It's been on my heart. 
Do your friends know Jesus? Does your family know Jesus? Does your community know Jesus? Because if the end times don't come tomorrow, they may come soon. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. Are we taking our responsibility seriously? It's a message of concern. I've been preaching about being different. I've been preaching about being set apart. I've been preaching for a very long time about the message that Jesus has given us, that we are not to just come to church and congregate, but we are to reach out to the community. We are to reach out to our world. The question is, are we taking the message seriously? As we continue through Matthew chapter 24, we get to verse 36. And in Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 36, Jesus makes some very, very crucial points. I believe he is telling three. He is telling us three distinct points. In Matthew chapter 24, starting verse 36, he says, be alert. Verse 26, 36 says, No one knows the day the Lord will return. I don't know. You don't know. Jesus himself does know. The angels don't know. God himself is the only one who knows. But he will send Jesus back. The question is, are you alert? Are you ready? Jesus then begins to say, the Son of Man will return. It will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, people were enjoying banquets, parties, and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat. The people of Noah had no clue the rain was coming. And I say that with a bit of sarcasm in my voice because Noah was tasked to build an ark. He built an ark. There's an exhibit in, in, I want to say Western Ohio. Is it in Ohio or is it in Indiana? The Noah exhibit. It's in Kentucky. They all kind of gather up. But it's in Kentucky, and what it is, it's the Noah Ark exhibit, and really it's something to see. My family and I were going to go there last year, but apparently they flooded. Um, no joke, we went there, we went to a, um, we were down that, in that area last year, and we, we were going to get tickets to go see it, but we found out they had major flooding in that area, and you couldn't actually get to the ark. But apparently it's something quite significant to see. It stands over 500 feet wide and 50 feet high. It took Noah and his sons 120 years to build. Imagine that. Noah lived to be 950 years old, so that was about one-ninth of his life spent on this project, and he worked on it from age 500 to 620, and that's a lot of time to build a boat. It's also a lot of time to gain a little bit of attention. I'm sorry, if you saw your neighbor building a boat in his backyard, you're going to pay attention. And yet the people of Noah's day didn't seem to understand, they didn't seem to take notice, they weren't alert enough to understand the signs that were being presented for them. They had no clue that God was sending a flood despite the fact that Noah told them, despite the fact that there was a big, giant boat. They had no clue it was coming. Jesus in Matthew 24 says, be alert, pay attention. He begins to, he continues. He continues in verse 43 and says, not only do you have to be alert, but be ready. Verse 43 talks about a burglar in the home. He says, knowing this, a homeowner, know, know this, 
a homeowner who knew exactly when a burglar was coming would stay alert and not permit the house to be broken into, you must also be ready all the time for the Son of Man would come when least expected. If you knew somebody was going to break into your house, if I knew Will was going to try to break into my house at 9 o'clock tomorrow, at 9 o'clock I'm going to be waiting for Will. Jesus says the same thing. He says, you've got to be ready. It could come tomorrow. It could come next year. It could come 100 years. Our time here on earth is so short compared to eternity. We need to make sure that we are ready. We need to make sure that we know where we're going. We need to make sure that we are prepared to meet Jesus. Not only do we have to be alert and pay attention, but we need to be ready to make sure that we are ready to meet Jesus. The question I have, are you serious? Are you ready? If your time would come tomorrow, would you walk into the arms of Jesus? Jesus says, be alert. Be ready. He also says, to be faithful. Verse 45. Verse 45. Jesus begins to tell the story of Mike and John. You see, Mike and Johnny's parents left for their dinner. They left for their dinner. And Mike was pretty good about it. Mike had his one friend over. He told his sister she can have her one friend over. Mike was pretty good. Mike followed the rules. Mike, sure, Mike made sure dinner was ready. He made sure that dinner was ready for his friend and his sister's friend. Meanwhile, Johnny decided... He was going to do what an adolescent boy does when the adolescent boy is put in charge. Johnny was going to go apart. Johnny called up all the friends that he knew who would come over and he said, my parents are out of town for the night. Come on over. And one by one, Johnny's friends came over and pretty soon the house was full. Johnny's friends invited friends and their friends invited other friends. And what turned out to be a small get-together turned out to be a huge party. Meanwhile, the money that was given to Johnny for food was now used to feed the entire party. Where was his sister, but his sister was stuck upstairs, afraid to come down. Pretty soon in Johnny's house, things were broken. The couch was broken, the window was broken, the lamp was broken. The fridge was raided and everything was eaten from it. Johnny's house kind of reminded me of a zoo. Well, bedtime came, and in Mike's house, Mike made sure his sister was in bed, had the friends, the friends had all gone for the night. The sister was in bed, and Mike was finished cleaning up, washing the dishes from dinner, and making sure that the house was swept up when mom and dad came. Now the parents weren't expected to come home until midnight. Midnight would be about the time. But about right after dinner, Mike's mother looked at Mike's father and said, something isn't right. I think I'm going to be sick. So the parents decided that in order to maintain some innocence and maintain some not being embarrassed in public, they decided that they were going to come home because the mother was sick. And because they all drove together, it wasn't fitting that one family go to the theater, but they all decided to come to the theater. Instead of going to the they all decided to come home instead of going to the theater. And at 9.30, sister had been in bed for about a half hour in Mike's house. The parents roll in. Well, meanwhile, at Johnny's house, people are still swinging from the lampshades. 
swinging from the chandeliers and breaking everything that they could. There's so many people around Johnny's house, it's hard to figure out where Johnny is. As they pull into the driveway, Johnny's parents look at each other and say, uh-oh, we have a problem. Mike's parents walk in, saw the house was all nice and neat. Everything was in order. Johnny's parents went to Johnny's house looking for Johnny. They didn't find Johnny. They found Billy. They found Leroy. They didn't find Johnny. So they went to the backyard, and there's Johnny. Staring at his parents with a blank look on his face as if to, know, if to say, oops, I've been caught. It's a story that we've seen in every movie ever made. It's a plot line of at least a dozen movies where the parents go out of town, the kids throw a party, and the parent comes home early. We've all been given this responsibility. We can all take, take a side, whether we're Mike or whether we're Johnny. You get to choose one. We've all been in this situation. We've been given the keys to the house. And we've been left in charge. The question is, how are we going to handle our business? How are we going to behave? Are we going to be prepared as if mom and dad are going to walk to the door at any moment? Are we going to throw caution to the wind? You see, Johnny thought that he could get everybody out before mom and dad got home and get everything cleaned up as if to make it look like nobody was here. But the question is, what happens when mom and dad decide to come home early? Are you ready? Did you take the responsibility of the house seriously? You see, Jesus says, I want you to be faithful. In verse 45 to 51, he leaves the responsibility of the house to the servants. He says, I want you to run the house. You're now in charge. He wants us to be faithful with what he gave us. He wants to be responsible for what he gave us. He gave us a mission. He gave us a calling. He said, go and make disciples. He said, be ready. You do not know the day or hour. But the question is, are we taking it seriously? Or do we live life with the understanding that there's always tomorrow? Some of us have spent a very long time sitting in our living rooms with the idea that there's always tomorrow. I can always tell the neighbor tomorrow. I can always tell my friend tomorrow. I can always tell them tomorrow until tomorrow never comes. In Matthew 24, Jesus is very clear. He wants us to be alert. He wants us to be ready, but He also wants us to be faithful. He has given us a responsibility and a task. He has told you, go and make disciples. He has called us to be different. The question is, are we living different? Are we living different? We've been talking about this for three and a half years at the Pottstown Church of the Nazarene, and I ask you one more time, are you taking the message seriously? He has called us to be different. Are we serious? I'm not here to tell you that the end of the world's coming and, and the rapture's coming and I am here to tell you that no one knows when it's coming. Are you ready? Have you sought forgiveness where forgiveness is needed? Have you forgiven those you need to forgive? 
Did you love your neighbor? My heart broke today. My heart's been breaking this morning. My heart's breaking. And I ask you, is the church serious about the message of Jesus? Are we loving? Are we forgiving? Are we understanding? I don't usually title my sermons with a question, but very simply, are you serious? You see, I believe that we are called for more. I believe that Jesus has a bigger plan for us. He says, be alert. He says, be ready. But he also says, be faithful. He's given you a call. He's given us a mission. Are we serious? I'm going to pray for us today. And as I do, I want those thoughts to run through your mind. I want the Spirit of God to fall on you. Are you taking the message of Jesus Christ? Or are you a, I'll do it tomorrow kind of person? Even though tomorrow may not come. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, we love you, and we give you all the praise and glory for all that you do in our lives. And Father, we, we reflect right now. Father God, we reflect right now because we you know if we were to be honest with ourselves, we haven't been doing all that you asked us to do. We haven't been living lives like you asked us to live. Father God, we just... We need you today. Open our eyes, God. Open our eyes, let us see the lives we are living in and how we need to change. Open our hearts, God. May we reflect the change you bring us to the world around us. You said to love our neighbors. Father God, are we loving our neighbors today? Search us, God. Search our hearts. Father God, we want to live for you. We want to be your disciples. We want to make disciples. And we want to spread the message of Jesus Christ to the world. Father God, we pray right now that you speak to each and every one of us. And may we know that you are God. We love you and praise you. We give you all the glory, all that you do. You are a good God. And we humbly bow before you. In your name we pray all things. Amen.